okay, so we're okay, it's working. So welcome everyone. Uh, well, today we have uh, Rajesh Gopakumar, who's going to give a talk on uh, from symmetric uh, product CFTs to ADS3. So, well, thank you very much, uh, Rajesh, for giving the talk and please, uh, well, stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Ander, and uh, everyone in the Paris group. Good to see you all friends, even if virtually, uh, and a uh, pleasure to be part of your seminar series. Uh, so this is a talk uh, based on uh, some uh, recent work uh, with, uh, uh, of course, my long-term collaborator, Matthias Gabardil, uh, my PhD student, uh, Pranabesh Moiti, and uh, Matthias' student, Bob Knighton. Uh, and uh, it's a paper that appeared about a couple of months ago. Uh, and um, I'll, the, hopefully the title will become explanatory as we go along. Uh, so, uh, so I was asked to give a little bit of uh, background to uh, the uh, uh, to this the topic uh, for uh, a bit more accessible. Uh, so I'll spend a little time on sort of broad motivations uh, and uh, uh, what is sort of behind this uh, whole uh, endeavor. Uh, I will need to give you some uh, uh, little bit of uh, technical background, especially for people who are not uh, so familiar with this on symmetric product orbifolds and the relation to uh, covering maps. Uh, I will then go on to sort of the uh, uh, meat of the talk, which is sort of, uh, uh, the, uh, the technical aspect, which will be about taking an appropriate large n limit and which we will be able to map to a particular matrix model uh, and uh, its solution will play a role. Uh, in fact, the rest of the talk will then be about explicating this solution or uh, sort of teasing out the meaning of this solution and it will uh, turn out to be about how uh, the Feynman diagrams of uh, the symmetric product uh, CFT essentially organize themselves into a sort of a stringy answer, a stringy correlator, and in particular what that uh, means for the dual string theory. And finally, I'll uh, end with some brief outlook. Uh, so motivation. Uh, so one big question, at least that has been driving some of my thinking in this is the question about uh, how exactly large and quantum field theories reorganize themselves into theories of strings. Of course, there's a sort of a, a top down or bottom up, I, I, I keep confusing, uh, I answer in terms of debrained physics, which, uh, which tells you that it's open closed string duality, which is uh, the underlying reason. And I like to draw this sort of postmodern version of the Cheshire Cat uh, uh, as an illustration now of how the holes in an open string description, uh, by the time you sum over all the holes, uh, you sort of end up with a closed string description with a different background. Uh, and this is how the passage between D3 brains and uh, um, a, a stack of D3 brains uh, and goes over to the ADS5 times S5. But of course, this is, um, a nice picture to have, but it's difficult to see how this explicitly happens, especially at large soft coupling, which is where uh, the original motive, the sort of the derivation, uh, the uh, intuition of Maldacena came in. Um, uh, and because of this, while we have a lot of examples coming from the string constructions, uh, we haven't been able to really delineate the scope of gate string duality uh, and say when uh, and uh, uh, which uh, large NQFTs uh, er, can reorganize themselves into string theories and what those string theories are, what their backgrounds are, et cetera. So, so that's sort of been uh, uh, the motivation. Um, so, uh, so of course, in ADS-CFT, uh, 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 if you kind of very crudely plot the parameter space into this horizontal axis, which is the Toft coupling or equivalently the radius of the ADS in uh, string units um, uh, uh, and the vertical axis being the string coupling or equivalently one over N uh, from the gauge theory point of view. Uh, most of uh, 
the studies have been in this tractable limit where the radius is very large in string units and therefore you can apply classical gravity plus perturbations uh, and uh, uh, study this vicinity. Uh, um, but I would like to shift the focus uh, of this talk uh, to the other corner that uh, we, where we understand the field theory, uh, but not so much the bulk theory. Uh, and this is this weak coupling limit of the uh, CFT, but that corresponds by this dictionary to a very strongly, a highly curved antidecitor space-time, or equivalently, you could call it a tensionless limit of the string theory. So it's a highly stringy regime where much of your intuition of classical gravity is uh, uh, probably breaking down. Uh, and this is, of course, because the dictionary between the Tuft coupling and the ADS radius is something like this. And we'll always look at the case where the string coupling is essentially uh, perturbative, uh, so n is very large, so we'll look at the leading planar limit. Uh, the advantage of looking at starting, let's say, at zero coupling is that now you have actually only a finite number of holes in this previous picture, in the sum over holes. In any correlator, there are only a finite number of holes to sum over. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there is uh, still a well-defined genus expansion. Uh, so this perhaps is a way, a place where you could hope to uh, make that uh, dictionary that um, uh, open closed string duality uh, a little more, a little more precise and understand it in generality. Um, and of course, if you understand the zero coupling limit, you can hope to uh, at least go a little bit along this axis um, by treating interactions the way we do in uh, our textbooks on quantum field theory, namely through uh, uh, considering them as uh, essentially correlators in a free quantum field theory, but uh, the interactions being additional vertices. And so that's uh, that's the motivation. Now, how do you try to more concretely, concretely proceed with this? Uh, well, I will adopt a following operational definition of what I would like to see as uh, the bare minimum of uh, uh, a derivation of ADS CFT, which is uh, which is to look at this dictionary between um, gauge invariant correlators of the of the field theory. Uh, we'll work in Euclidean space uh, for simplicity, uh, so that's why the uh, correlators are on the sphere, d-dimensional sphere, uh, and uh, we will assume there's a large n expansion, and you can pull out the contributions of uh, some of these correlator, uh, genus by genus. Uh, and uh, these are additional labels, which we'll uh, make more concrete in uh, particular examples. But right now, you can think of them. These are essentially some dimensions of the space-time fields, uh, and the conformal dimensions of the space-time fields. And x's will denote always the positions in the gauge theory. Uh, whereas uh, on the right-hand side, we we'll have what uh, might schematically be denoted as a string correlator, uh, which is in terms of, uh, again, an endpoint correlator on a world sheet uh, with vertex operators, physical vertex operators here, uh, um, which are inserted at the points zi on the world sheet. And so zs will always denote for me world sheet coordinates. And of course, they carry labels corresponding to the space time uh, and, uh, and the same other additional labels that are there over here. But of course, uh, perturbative string theory, uh, if you are uh, computing a genus G correlator, you're instructed to uh, compute this sort of sigma model correlator and then integrate over the corresponding modelized space uh, of the genus G surface with n punctures. n is the number of uh, the insertions uh, here. Of course, uh, having such a, uh, uh, having a dictionary like this uh, between correlators in the field theory and uh, world sheet uh, or uh, string theory scattering amplitudes presupposes that there is a, firstly a correspondence between physical single trace gauge invariant operators and physical operators on the uh, the BRST cohomology, if you wish, on the uh, string theory side. You, this, of course, is a prerequisite to be able to 
even make uh, such a claim. Uh, so, uh, um, so, but uh, supposing we are in such a situation, then uh, what one would like to do, or what I would ideally like to see, uh, is a way in which you can show and uh, make the equality between these manifest between the left hand side and the right hand side over here, and. Um, and in a way, this is a mathematically well-posed question because the left-hand side is, uh, uh, in, in our case, actually free quantum field theory, but more generally, let's say, a fixed point of a conformal field theory, uh, of a quantum field theory, a conformal field theory. And you can define it uh, as uh, uh, by, with your favorite definition. So the left-hand side uh, is something uh, you would all feel comfortable. Uh, um, and def uh, uh, defining or uh, indeed calculating, but um, the right hand side perhaps is less. Uh, we have fewer examples where we have a well defined um, uh, right hand side, but in principle, the idea is that there is some sort of a sigma model which describes the captures the world sheet of the string theory and uh, and uh, this uh, is also a two-dimensional cft and there are rules for computing correlators in that two-dimensional cft and in principle this object should be autonomously well defined independent of the definition here and it's a well posed question to ask when does such an equality hold or can we actually make this equality in a sense topological it can be kind of uh, in a way is show that the left-hand side or the right-hand side are manifestly the same as the other. Uh, sorry, Rajesh, uh, yes. question. When you yeah. mean that you, there are ways of calculating this on the, on the string theory side, do you mean the types of uh, approaches that Kazakov and collaborators have developed or something else? Uh, no, I'm uh, just, um, just old fashioned uh, perturbative 2D CFT. So uh, I will, of course, talk of one in which the case uh, which uh, of ADS3 times S3, where uh, with NSNS flux, where, of course, there is a well-defined world sheet uh, CFT. But uh, I have in mind uh, that this is actually broader than that. Uh, and there are cases, and let's say even with ADS5 times S5, uh, perhaps the Berkowitz formulation or some other formulation overcoming some of the technical challenges of Ramon Ramon feels that there is some underlying two-dimensional CFT with well-defined rules for computing uh, correlators of BRST invariant operators. So it's only at that broad level that I have in mind. Okay. Uh, um, but for the specific case, I will be mostly considering there will be a very specific uh, 2D CFT, but I suspect it is much more general and whatever obstacles we have are merely technical. I mean, one, yes. one, Eric, yeah. more, one more general kind of limitation to tautologizing the correspondence in this language is that, you know, we don't know that every CFT has a string dual, so there may not be the necessary ingredients on, to define that right-hand side, unless you... Yeah, uh, so in fact, that is part of the quest. Uh, as I said, uh, one of the motivations is to delineate the scope, when and where, which CFTs have this. So ideally, I would like to be able to have a... a, a um, mechanism, uh, and I'll try to sort of uh, show the direction in which, uh, how far one can try to go in that direction, where one can answer such questions. I mean, uh, at the moment, we, we our only source for getting uh, possibly true examples of this correspondence is through the brain constructions. Uh, I would like to have uh, a picture which is much more first principles and tells you when, at least in the case of weekly couple uh, QFTs, where uh, this might there might be a bona fide string theory on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. And thanks. So. Uh, okay, so this was, of course, uh, very broad and uh, very this thing, but I, I would like to uh, uh, to say that there's a proof of concept that you can actually in which this can be actually realized and this is a specific case of the ads cft correspondence namely of the ads3 cft2 uh, where a lot of this discussion uh, can be made extremely explicit extremely concrete uh, and um, uh, we can see multiple features and i'll try to bring out uh, some of this 
so this uh, the context is one of the canonical examples of ADS CFT, namely string theory on this background, uh, ADS three times S three times T four. But now with the smallest unit of NSNS flux that you can have, namely one unit uh, of NSNS flux, and the claim is firstly that uh, this uh, CFT, which was always believed to be somewhere, I mean, this CFT or its cousin with Ramon Ramon flux was always believed to be dual to some point in the modelized space of the symmetric product CFT. But uh, in recent work, we identified uh, uh, precisely the a case where this uh, symmetric product CFT at its free point, uh, um, the orbifold CFT at its uh, orbifold point, um, uh, in the limit where uh, you take n to infinity, is dual to uh, to this uh, string theory. And uh, the uh, this uh, the first piece of evidence was uh, making this correspondence be this uh, between states. Uh, in the theory, in this case, these are the so-called single cycle states of the symmetric orbifold uh, being dual to uh, physical states uh, of the uh, uh, string theory over here. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, not something I will go over very much, but uh, I mean, I talked some of this in the strings um, um, a meeting. In fact, I, uh, there we, uh, there uh, I talked about our work uh, of 2019 where, uh, where we even uh, went, uh, where uh, what we could show uh, was uh, this derivation uh, uh, making this equality manifest, uh, because what we computed was the right hand side of this uh, uh, theory, which is a well defined sigma model. We showed that the CFT with k equal to one is somewhat unusual, uh, and especially when you consider the so called spectrally flowed sectors, which uh, so this index W corresponds to this uh, uh, this notion of spectral flow that uh, you have in these uh, uh, string theories. So the correlators uh, for such spectrally flowed operators on the world sheet uh, is quite subtle. And at k equal to one, they have a rather unusual delta function localization. So there's a product over here of n minus three delta functions. Uh, 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 so the claim is that this world sheet correlates is localized to points on the modelized space. And I'll focus on genus zero for simplicity. It's localized to points on the modelized space, which are the ones that admit branched covers from the world sheet, which is now genus zero surface, to the space-time, the, the S2 on the boundary of the space-time. Uh, uh, and uh, so a branch cover like this, so x is the space-time coordinate and uh, z is the world sheet coordinate, but and which has branching wi, this label wi, which is sort of the spectral flow index from the point of view of the world sheet theory, and which is essentially the length of the cycle of the orbifold from the point of view of the um, uh, symmetric orbifold theory. Uh, uh, so uh, this uh, uh, WI turns out to capture the branching data. Uh, so in other words, this uh, covering map looks in the vicinity of z equal to zi. It has a branching of order wi. And, uh, and the point zi is mapped to the point xi. So we showed this sort of a little indirectly in our original paper. But recently, in another paper we wrote a few months ago, we showed that this follows from a rather remarkable twistorial incidence property that the, uh, that the world sheet theory uh, obeys uh, at k equal to one. But again, that will not be what I will talk about over here. So, uh, so what I, uh, so, so here, just to sort of, uh, uh, so that you don't get lost, uh, what we uh, were showing here was that uh, we were starting with the right hand side and the string world sheet theory showed that it localizes to certain points uh, that on the uh, on the moduli space of the um, uh, of the world sheet theory uh, namely the points that obey this relation so supposing i fix my zi and my xi then of course there are n minus 3 delta functions over here which is exactly the dimension of the complex dimension of the uh, moduli space of n punctured 
uh, sphere. Uh, and um, these delta function contributions actually give you exactly the answer that the symmetric orbifold gives you. So, um, and uh, some ingredients of that I will um, I will bring into the story a little later. But this was the the big um, the bottom line was the uh, that this side could be kind of rewritten manifestly as. Uh, what you would do to compute the right hand, uh, the left hand side. So without actually explicitly evaluating the left and the right hand side, this was a way in which you could sort of transform the right hand side to the left hand side. So in some sense, that was the uh, that was what we uh, uh, were doing there. Uh, Sorry, and, just one question. Yes. Uh, yes. Normally, in a CFT that we use in string theory, the correlators have power like behavior for mm -hmm. various reasons. How come you get delta functions? So this, of course, is something which is, I think, uh, the underlying reason, the one line reason to your question is, I think that it's a topological string theory. Uh, and there are many indications of this, uh, that uh, this k equal to one theory is really some kind of a topological string theory. And in topological string theory, this sort of feature does happen. Um, and the correlators are often delta function localized, which is why they are uh, sort of, so there's some so underlying- you mean, you mean that k equal to one corresponds to bosonic level k equal to zero? No, it's actually k equal to three. There's a shift by, yeah, k plus two. I see. Uh, so it's SL2 at, yeah, so, uh, but I, I think the, the supersymmetric theory is some, there's some underlying um, uh, topological twist. It's effectively a topologically twisted sigma model. And uh, I, can t I can go into some reasons for that later, uh, if you're interested. But um, that, I think, is the bottom line. But okay. now we ha see this from both the ward identities, the SL2 ward identities, and as I said, from a free field realization of this theory uh, that exists at k equal to 1, there's a kind of this twistorial incidence relation also leads to the same delta function properties. Uh, so there's multiple reasons uh, now to really this thing that this uh, this does happen. Uh, and of course, it is exactly what one needs for this correspondence to work. Uh, and, um, and we'll, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I was talking about going from the right hand side to the left hand side. And that in a way seems easier to do because you if you know the right hand side, you can try to uh, look at this, uh, you, you evaluate the correlator or you study the correlator and argue in some way that it must be equal to the left-hand side. It, it seems much more difficult to go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, uh, from fields to strings, because in some ways you have to reconstruct a world sheet integrand and that's of course not unique because you can always add total derivatives and, and so on. And uh, uh, we are familiar with that in our, uh, even from world sheet uh, descriptions of uh, str uh, free, str I mean, flat space string theories. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that does not preclude having a canonical or some natural form for the correlator on the right hand side. And that's what I claim uh, will happen. Uh, and uh, this a way of trying to recast the correlators of a field theory as an integration, an integral over modelized space uh, with some uh, integrand which corresponds to a stringy correlator is, is sort of a general. Uh, it, we, uh, what I will try to show is that uh, for the symmetric product CFT, this will realize this sort of a broad general approach that I had sort of uh, developed many years ago uh, to, uh, to, to carry out this sort of passage. Uh, and I'll just summarize right now in a slide what the general broad idea is, and then we'll see the specific realization in this particular system as we go along. So the basic idea is that if you are looking, of course, at, as I said, in the weakly couple theory, the free field theories, then you have a Feynman diagram contributions to each of uh, to these correlators. Uh, and uh, if you wish, you can view this Feynman diagrams as a uh, sum over world lines of different topologies. Uh, and uh, in a large end theory, uh, 
the idea is that this sum can be recast as a sum or an integral uh, over world distinct world sheet topologies, which is what uh, uh, distinct world sheets, uh, and which is what the modelized space is uh, uh, about. And that re uh, realizing the open closed string duality whereby the Toft double lines can get glued up in a very specific way to form the closed string world sheets on the right hand side. So just in pictures, uh, uh, so you have correlators of the field theory, which would be uh, sum over various world lines or diagrams. And the claim is that this sum can be rearranged into a sum over world sheets. And in fact, it's a, there's a very canonical way to go from here to here, uh, which associates to each Feynman graph a a closed world sheet, meaning a point on the modelized space uh, uh, on the right hand side. And this uses a very nice parameterization of the modelized space uh, due to the, uh, which employs the mathematics of Strebel differentials and gives a very natural parameterization of modelized space, which is exactly what we need for this open closed string duality to, to take place. So essentially to each Feynman diagram, so this you can think of these as double line strips, uh, to each Feynman diagram, there's a canonical way to glue them together to form a closed string world sheet using this treble parameterization. And we'll see a realization of exactly this idea of coming out without having to sort of do anything. It just sort of comes out of the box when we uh, look at the symmetric orbifold correlators. So in some ways, I view this as some kind of a refinement of the Toft. Uh, Toft taught us that you can very naturally assign a genus to double line Feynman diagrams. And that was sort of the initial reason to believe that there might be a string dual to uh, larger uh, gauge theories. Uh, this is in some ways a further refinement, which says not just a genus, you can assign the whole genus modelized space comes out from the Feynman diagrams because you can very canonically associate to Feynman graphs points on the world sheet, uh, which implement this gluing in a very natural way. So that's uh, that's the broad picture. So that was sort of the motivation. Now, uh, I, as I said, I, I will focus on this particular example, and uh, but I'll have to give you some uh, background on the symmetric orbifold correlator. Sure. Is... Rajesh, can I ask a question sure. about the treble map? Is this covering densely the boduli space? So yeah, there are it, it cover, it's a one is to one cover. And, and the question of the density, maybe it will become a little more clear when I come uh, at the end, uh, when I talk about the specific uh, so mm, yeah, so uh, so let me answer the question about the density a bit later, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, but it is a one is there will be a uh, it's a cover that, because what this gives you, what the Feynman graphs give you, is essentially uh, when you go through the treble parameterization, it's a simplicial decomposition of the modelized space that you get. And each simplex corresponds to sort of one Feynman uh, graph topology. And, uh, and so you sort of will essentially be able to but cover the, the whole of mod modelized But there is space. some metric also, no, I mean, uh, it's not uh, all it's actually uh, for the the measure on the modelized space. Um, uh, so I, I, yes, maybe I'll again come sure. to that at the end uh, when I have some more expressions on the page. Uh, so, uh, so the, um, uh, the, uh, so, so as I said, we we'll try to implement this fields to strings um, program in this case test case of this symmetric orbifold CFT, which is simple enough but yet complex uh, has enough complexity. So we are looking at this orbifold uh, of n k copies of T four <laughs> orbifolded by the symmetric group that permutes these k copies, and we are looking at the limit as k goes to infinity, and uh, the. Correlators we will consider 
are uh, things in the W cycle twisted sector. So the, sing the analog of single trace operators here are those where you consider uh, the twisted sectors labeled by a conjugacy class with a single cycle of length W. Uh, and uh, very more specifically, we will consider the ground states of those twisted cycle sectors that will not be a that will be a rather inessential um, aspect it's a bit like restricting to tachyon vertex operators if you're uh, considering uh, gen uh, uh, general properties of uh, string theory uh, there you have you can decorate uh, them now with additional oscillators similarly here you can sort of look at the excitations above each uh, w cycle twisted sector but these w's are will play the role of the tachyon momentum, if you wish, and you have multiples in the large K limit, you have infinitely Ws go from one to infinity, uh, and you can consider the correlator of this kind. Now, this uh, these were studied, uh, these have been studied, and uh, people uh, here in the audience, uh, in Paris, definitely people like Jan uh, and so on have uh, looked at it. Uh, but uh, one insight that we will use is uh, that of uh, Lunin and Mathur, who gave a very nice way to think of these correlators and to actually compute them, which is inspired in some ways by the replica trick. Uh, uh, so this is an idea probably that may be familiar to many people that you can compute this by going to a covering space. So if you are computing the correlator on this S2, uh, which is your space time uh, S2, you, you lift it to a covering space in which these Ws, uh, in, in which these fields, the twist fields that you insert over here become single valued fields uh, uh, on the covering space. Uh, so the cycles here, we have I've shown cycles of length two. Uh, so you have a branch point then uh, in the covering space and you insert, uh, you lift the points, the, the points of where the twist fields are inserted are uh, lift to branch points on the covering space. Space. And the covering space can have a topology and which is determined by uh, various uh, the, these numbers. Uh, but um, and you, uh, so the idea was instead of computing on this space, you it's easier to compute on the covering space. The, you, the price you pay is that you have a non-trivial branching structure and you have a covering map, which you have to find uh, which uh, will uh, which captures the uh, branching structure uh, at each of these uh, insertion points and sort of puts them all together in a consistent way. Uh, but and the nice thing uh, when you're considering ground states is that these uh, uh, go over to just vacuum in, uh, insertions on the uh, identity insertions on the covering space. And uh, so instead of computing a correlator here, you you compute a a path integral uh, in this particular case, a vacuum path integral on this covering space. And now with a single copy of the T4, because that's what going to the covering space does, that instead of all these multiple copies of T4, which are permuted, you have a single copy of T4, but uh, uh, on the uh, bigger covering space. And uh, these covering maps have the behavior, like I said before, if I have uh, this W, then they have to have a branching of order WI at the at the points ZI, and uh, so uh, so the covering map maps ZI to XI with this branching W. So that's uh, the way Lunin and Mathur uh, said that instead of computing this on the original S2, you get a sum over contributions from all the covering maps that are allowed, uh, which have this specific behavior. So there in general will be um, discreetly many of these covering maps uh, that uh, are there. Uh, because supposing I were to, uh, I mean, if you are familiar with the mathematics of covering maps, uh, the way the problem is normally phrased is that if I specify the points on the covering space, the ZIs and the branching data WIs, it's easy to convince yourself that you can specify three points on the target space and, and three of the X's you can by Mobius transformations, put them at zero, 
1 and infinity, but then the remaining n minus 3 of the xi's are determined. Uh, you don't have any freedom. So covering maps are very rigid in that sense. Uh, so, but there are discreetly many choices of them, and that, uh, and you sum over all these contributions. And, uh, but for us, perhaps the viewpoint which is more natural is sort of an inverse one because we are specifying the points xi on the original space uh, and uh, uh, the data wi, the branching data. Then you equivalently determine n minus three of the zi's, and you, the other three are put at zero, one, and infinity. So you de you determine these, and that means these covering maps exist on a discrete set of points on the moduli space of this n punctured sphere. Uh, if I think of uh, the moduli space of if I'm if my covering space is of genus zero and uh, uh, and in the large k limit, uh, the dominant contribution will be from uh, those. Uh, and the uh, uh, what uh, uh, I get uh, uh, are a set of the. Uh, the covering maps exist at a discrete set of points uh, on the on the space of these uh, moduli space of the uh, covering space, the n punctured sphere. And uh, how do you actually compute the correlator? You uh, you realize that uh, there is a pullback uh, from your original space to the covering space. And uh, this induces a metric on your covering space. And there is a now, uh, this is a non-trivial metric, and there's a Liouville action for this conformal factor, which is given by the usual uh, sort of action. So this phi is log of del gamma square, mod del gamma square, that's the uh, covering uh, conformal factor. And this is the usual action. C is the central charge of the seed CFT, which will be six in our case. Uh, and this has to be treated with a little care with some regularization and normal, uh, normalization. Uh, and uh, Lunin Mather did that and illustrated how that very neatly gives you a very computationally effective way, gives you uh, these correlators. Okay, so that's one uh, thing I will need to use. There's another piece of background I need to uh, in, uh, remind you, uh, which is that uh, the uh, there is a, a very nice construction which was realized some years later by these folks here, which associated a free field like Feynman diagram for each of these covering map contributions. So I mentioned that there's a sum over contributions and there's a nice way in which you can associate a Feynman diagram, uh, a very free field like diagram for each of these covering maps. And uh, for that, what you do is, uh, let's say you have a four point function uh, uh, on your original uh, space, uh, the X space. Uh, you draw a curve passing through those four points, uh, but a kind of a bifundamental curve in which there's a dashed loop on the outside and a, uh, and, um, uh, and a solid loop on the inside. And inside and outside are with respect to this point infinity. So, uh, so my convention will be that the, uh, the, uh, the solid line uh, encloses infinity and the dashed line is the complement. Uh, so this is sort of a bifundamental like graph, but when you pull it back, now the xi's, which are the points here, go to the zi's and the target space uh, in the covering space. And uh, the image of this uh, under this covering map, this uh, this graph goes to some graph here, which will take a structure like this. And there'll be many such graphs which uh, you can sum over. And each covering, uh, so each graph, each covering map corresponds to a specific graph, which is uh, specified by the pre-images. So essentially this uh, uh, colored uh, loop go, uh, goes to various pre-image color loops and there will be n pre-images and n is the degree of the map. Uh, and each of those will contain the image of the point, pre-image of the point x equal to infinity. So I choose infinity because that's the pole of the cover, um, covering map and that will be important for what uh, I have to say later. Uh, so uh, these are the points that are ma which these points here are the ones which are correspond to the poles of the covering map, uh, which uh, map to infinity. 
And this graph in some ways triangulates the covering space very much like the large end uh, Toft diagram triangulates uh, the covering space, uh, which we will be identifying with the world sheet. Um, so this is a nice construction and uh, it's very reminiscent of a kind of a bifundamental gauge theory, which is perhaps not too surprising, but in any case, it's a, it's a nice, uh, well-defined mathematical construction and uh, we will employ this. Now, uh, so covering maps are clearly very important to being able to compute correlators of um, symmetric or befold uh, or befold uh, operators, uh, but they are very hard to write down very explicitly. Even for a four-point function on a sphere, it's very hard to write them uh, in general. Uh, uh, so we'll stick to, as I said, genus zero covering space, but and uh, look at uh, the endpoint correlator or n branch points and uh, will denote the degree by capital N. So we have this covering map from the covering space, which is also a sphere to the target space, which is also a sphere. Now maps from the sphere to the sphere are rational functions. And if they are of degree N, you can write them as a degree N polynomial by a degree N polynomial. I will parameterize the poles uh, of the gamma by lambda a. So the degree n polynomial means uh, this has n, uh, there are n poles, these lambdas, and which are the pre-images uh, that I just showed you in the previous slide. Uh, uh, or equivalently, if I look at the derivative of gamma, I can write it, these single poles go over to double poles when I take the derivative. And the numerator is uh, something which vanishes at all the branch points at now with degree wi minus one, because we've taken a derivative uh, and you can convince yourself that the numerator is just a product of these and the denominator is uh, has these double poles. Uh, um, so uh, you can, this is a nice way to parameterize the covering maps, at least from the sphere to the sphere. Now, if you want to solve for these covering maps, uh, uh, given whatever branching data, uh, you have um, uh, one way to do this is some uh, is a nice observation uh, made by in this paper of 2018, and that uh, you just need to require that del gamma does not have any simple poles at z equal to lambda a, namely the residue of the simple pole vanishes because if not, then if you integrated del gamma, you would have got a log in gamma, and but you know that gamma is purely rational. So you require all the residues to vanish. And the requirement that all the residues uh, of the simple poles vanish in this expression can be uh, easily seen to be this set of equations. So you need it to vanish for each of these lambda a's. So from a going from one to n, the number, uh, of these poles. And that gives a set of equations, which is essentially uh, a complicated set of equations uh, for the lambda a's. So in some ways, uh, this is, uh, uh, you can, uh, in, the co in the conventional uh, uh, picture where it's, it's people give you zi and wi, these equations are supposed to then determine for you the lambdas and therefore the whole covering map. Uh, and uh, there are n equations over here. And in fact, they were kind of called scattering equations because they have a nice, uh, they are sort of uh, reminiscent of these CHY scattering equations. Anyhow, there are equations to be solved for these poles. That's one way to characterize uh, how or try to compute covering maps, but these are difficult to still solve. Uh, Okay, so now I come to finally uh, the technical um, uh, part of the uh, uh, of our work, which was to to re to realize that you can actually look at these correlators in a very special limit, which is a kind of a gross mendel like limit where the dimensions or equivalently the energies in ADS become very large. So, uh, so, so the, let's uh, understand that a bit. I just mentioned I had mentioned that correlators get contributions from a finite number of covering maps, and uh, you can uh, you can uh, uh, argue that uh, that number scales with n and uh, the little n as well as the degree capital n of the covering map, uh, 
in this way where the degree of the covering map is given by the Riemann Horowitz formula in terms of the branching data WI. Uh, so it goes as some power of n for an endpoint function, it, uh, for a four point function n is four, a little n is four, this is just n, n square. Uh, so, uh, so there are finite number of usually you pick up a finite number of points on modelized space where, the, as I said, the discovering maps exist. But uh, to see the full stringy modelized space, uh, uh, the way you could uh, hope to do that is by taking these W's to be very large, because then if the W's all become very large, then N becomes very large and the number of covering maps also grows and you might hope uh, that they will densely cover modelized space as uh, Costas was sort of uh, indicating and asking. So we'll take uh, this limit, which is a kind of a gross mende like limit. Uh, it's gross mende like because remember I said these are like tachyon vertex operators, and you're now taking the energies uh, very large because that's what the, di the dimensions, the space time dimensions grow like W, they grow like W when W is large or equivalently grow like N. So we'll take N to infinity, this degree to infinity, such that each of these WIs are finite. And so WIs all uniformly grow uh, and you keep this ratio uh, fixed, uh, alpha I. And uh, so the total, so each of them, the dimensions are growing like N. So we'll be taking, this is the N which uh, we'll be taking to infinity, should not be confused with the capital N of the symmetric product and so on. We have taken the symmetric product, in fact, I denoted it by K. We have taken that to infinity, we'll keep that very large, but, uh, for, uh, but here we are looking at the effectively the degree or the uh, dimensions of these operators and taking that to infinity and that's the large N limit. And, and that um, is actually very nice because if you recall, I just showed you these scattering equations that determine the covering map. Now these, in, as n becomes very large, this n, the degree, you, you will recognize in Paris, of course, uh, you'll recognize this are saddle points of a matrix model uh, where this is the, um, um, the, this is the eigenvalue repulsion term. So you can interpret lambda A and lambda B as, uh, as eigenvalues of a matrix model. Uh, and um, uh, this is the eigenvalue repulsion term. And this is sort of the derivative of the potential. And th the scattering equation is essentially nothing other than a saddle point. And it's a saddle point of a special matrix model because the derivative of the potential is this. Uh, that's what uh, the saddle point uh, would uh, tell you. So, and so the potential itself is a logarithmic potential when you integrate this. So it's uh, what is called a Penner-like matrix model. So it has uh, these log of Z minus ZI with fixed coefficients alpha i as n goes to infinity, the alpha i were held fixed. So remember alpha i is essentially this wi, uh, the branching um, data. So, so you have a Penner-like model with uh, little n is the number of uh, points in the branch, uh, the n point function that you're considering. Uh, and uh, so this is a, um, uh, Penner like potential, which has actually appeared in discussions of AGT and their relation to uh, topological strings and so on. But uh, independent of that, uh, you can, this is a well defined uh, uh, um, uh, set of equations which you can apply all your tools of matrix models. Uh, you uh, define the resolvent, the usual resolve, uh, define a resolvent in this way. And um, uh, uh, where, the, where you expect these lambda A's to sort of coalesce into some support uh, or some curve C. And you uh, define this and then these uh, obey some loop equations. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's uh, very easy to write them down from the saddle point, even for finite n, if, uh, you have uh, in terms of uh, the so-called spectral curve, which is just uh, shifted, uh, the resolvent shifted by a piece involving the potential W prime, 
uh, this is the loop equation that you can write down, which determines the spectral curve in terms of uh, uh, the potential and this R of Z is also defined in terms of the uh, potential. Uh, it's the quantum correction term, if you wish. Um, so this spectral curve, in fact, is very simply related to your original covering map that we uh, we are setting out to solve in this large n limit. So, uh, so if you just use the definition of uh, y, you see that uh, the potential term gives you this, and this was the uh, uh, term involving the resolvent. That's something like this. So, this is in, if you just go back to the mm, parameterization of the uh, uh, covering map that I wrote down over here. This is. And, and nothing but the derivative of the log of uh, del gamma. Uh, um, and, uh, and this, if you wish, is also the Liouville field that I uh, introduced a while ago of Lunin and Mathur. So this is something to keep in mind that the spectral curve is related both to this Liouville field of Lunin Mathur, as well as the covering map in a very direct way. So, uh, so just to recap uh, our problem, we, we, it's very difficult to solve for covering maps at finite, uh, for a finite uh, n, for finite degree. But when the degree becomes very large, uh, it's, it's, uh, you, the solution is in some ways more tractable. Uh, this somehow doesn't, at least we couldn't find any um, precursors for this in the literature, but it is a simple observation that uh, the, uh, you can compute covering maps uh, in terms of uh, matrix models uh, as uh, uh, you take uh, uh, the degree very large and uh, it's essentially the spectral curve of the matrix model that is uh, which is in turn determined by this equation the loop equation that gives you the uh, that determines the covering map essentially uh, uh, so and so how do you actually go about solving it? Well, we have the spec, uh, so at leading order in large n in this equation, you can drop the one over n corrections over here and you just have this W prime square term and this correction term. And if you rationalize the, the W prime has these uh, poles and if you rationalize it, you just get something which has these uh, poles at the double poles at zi, and there's a numerator which are polynomials um, because these are just rational functions, uh, and the polynomials have shown their degrees over here. Uh, there's a degree two n minus four polynomial on in the numerator, and uh, there are these double poles over here. So this spectral curve at leading order in large n has uh, little n double poles. n is the little n is the number of uh, um, branch points or uh, the course, uh, correlator, the number of uh, fields in the correlator. And the numerator has uh, zeros, 2n minus 4 zeros. Uh, is a, so it's a polynomial of degree 2n minus 4 over here. You can read that from here. Of this only, this is unknown because this is coming from that additional correction term over here. Uh, this is, of course, known from uh, given by this. So there are unknown coefficients here. Uh, and you can see that there are actually n minus three unknown coefficients in this uh, uh, polynomial. And then there are n minus three cross ratios, which uh, uh, we will also, uh, these zi's, which we'll also take to be uh, uh, our unknowns. We are trying to determine the covering map given the xi's. And one way to fix them is like what you normally do in a matrix model like this, you look at the sort of filling fractions. So you can in, uh, look at the integral of the spectral curve, uh, or the, the square root of this, uh, so this y naught of z, uh, the periods. If you look at these periods, this is a Riemann surface. Uh, it has two n minus four zero. So it has branch cuts, uh, there are n minus two uh, branch cuts. Uh, and uh, so it's a, a genus n minus three Riemann surface. And so there are two n minus six periods. And if you parameterize the A cycle and the B cycle periods, if I call, denote them as over here, then that's one way to parameterize the different covering map solutions. So I mentioned that there were 
uh, finitely many covering maps uh, earlier, but now in the large n limit, uh, all the different covering maps are specified by specifying these two n minus six different periods of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, curve over here or this differential over here. And uh, once you specify those uh, periods, you can you determine what the uh, what these unknowns are in principle. Of course, they are transcendental equations, but in principle, you uh, uh, determine these n minus three unknown parameters here and n minus three cross ratios here. Uh, they are fixed by these two n minus six equations. And uh, so once you fix them, you have your y naught. Uh, and uh, that in turn defines the covering map. So this is the large N or the large degree solution of the covering map question and, and that the matrix model gives you. Uh, but, and I'll tell you in a moment what the interpretation of these parameters are from a somewhat different point of view. Uh, but this is the, just a mathematical solution of the problem of finding covering maps of large degree. But uh, I, I want to point out something very interesting here, uh, which is uh, I was here looking at the leading large n solution of this uh, loop equations. But you can, of course, consider the one over n correction that you have over here. And quite remarkably, if you just compute that, you get this uh, Schwarzian of the covering map. Uh, the combination, if you recall, y was just given by the spectral curve was just the derivative of log of del gamma. So if you just put that in, you just get the Schwarzian. So in other words, if I just look at the one over n corrected uh, piece, uh, you get the, uh, the uh, so you get an equation for the, uh, for the covering map, which is a very nice equation, namely the, the, the Schwarzian covering map is equal to this thing, which is this rational function over here. Uh, and uh, and the left hand side, of course, we know transforms as a quadratic differential, and it's it has double poles, uh, z equal to zi, with these residues uh, which are proportional to alpha i uh, at large uh, leading order in large n. Uh, Rajesh, uh, yes. question: uh, mm. The reason you get this variant there is because the problem you are solving is equivalent to a uniformization problem. Is that correct? Yeah, probably. I mean, there is uh, that's uh, there is probably uh, uh, something like that. I haven't. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, because I haven't been. I haven't completely follow, um, You know, seen that to the that okay. thread. Maybe I can, but, uh, I... but I suspect that you're right. I uh, suspect that because in some sense, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so, but it would be, uh, I, here it just came out, of course, but, but that's probably the underlying reason. Uh, so, uh, so the spectral curve, as I said, it determines uh, the eigenvalue density that was almost by definition and because it was just a shifted uh, resolvent. It determines the eigenvalue density of the poles in the colored loops of this Feynman graph. So if you recall now, I, now I go back to the diagrammatic picture of these uh, covering loop maps uh, and uh, e each of these poles were uh, the pre-images of the of infinity, uh, and uh, uh, but we at the same time now see that in this large n limit, the um, the these poles uh, uh, whose density is measured by this resolvent or the spectral curve, uh, they, they, the, these curves have coalesced into these poles have coalesced into these cuts of the spectral curve in the usual way we know for eigenvalues. And uh, these are, uh, so, uh, so in, indeed the interpretation of the periods of the spectral curve, uh, which we had here, uh, these, so now we can actually see the meaning of these uh, periods in a very geometric way. The meaning of the periods is just uh, each of these periods is just counting the number of poles that are there in in a given cut 
which uh, which is between um, so and the, the number of poles uh, if you uh, uh, go back to the diagrammatic picture each pole is associated to one of these uh, colored loops of the corresponding Feynman diagram and the, and the number of uh, poles in each cut corresponds to actually the um, uh, the uh, number of wick contractions in this language between a pair of vertices. So you can associate each of these cuts, uh, the transverse uh, to each of these cuts is, uh, is uh, you are the contractions of your, uh, from uh, the different pairs of vertices. And each of these uh, different cuts just corresponds to the number of contractions. So these are essentially the number of uh, um, so these periods that we had are just the number of uh, contractions that that particular diagram has. So now you see the number of inequivalent covering maps uh, are parameterized, of course, by the inequivalent weak contractions, the number of different weak contractions that you have. Just like in flats, I mean, in Yang Mills theory, the different, uh, you, if I consider a fixed correlator with large number of operate a uh, large number of fields at each vertex, there will be many, many big contractions between the fields. And uh, the number of big contractions between pairs of vertices is a parameter which sort of specifies the number of the topology or the, the, the kind of Feynman diagrams that you have. Uh, so that's what these periods are specifying. So they are nothing but the numbers or the fractions yeah, uh, of the number of big contractions that you have. And these are precisely, there are two and minus six of these and, um, uh, and they obey certain constraints which comes from the total number at each um, vertex, et cetera. So that's the diagrammatic interpretation of the periods uh, that they, they are counting the number of big contractions. So the, this was the picture between a pair of edges but the global picture is like this. So if I go back to the kind of diagram that I drew uh, now here on the covering space, I have multiple weak contractions between pairs of uh, edges and each of these cuts are kind of uh, computing the number of such uh, poles or the number of such, um, mm, uh, the uh, uh, the number of uh, these contractions, and uh, you can see that this the system of the cuts that you had uh, uh, that the spectral curve uh, the spectral curve had this system of cuts which corresponds which is in some sense each cut is transverse to a sort of a pair uh, of uh, vertices, uh, so it gives you uh, a graph which is dual to the graph of the original Feynman diagram corresponding to that correlator. So these are the poles and these are the cuts and the, the, that's the solid line over here. And that was is dual to the kind of skeleton Feynman diagram that you associate to the original uh, uh, covering map. And the periods are just counting the number of cuts uh, the number of uh, big contractions that you have along each of these pairs. Uh, and you can uh, convince yourself that it's the dual, it has n faces, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, the dual graph here has n faces because each face in, has a uh, has one of the vertices of my original, this thing or corresponds to a pole ZI. And there are the zeros, which are uh, the uh, endpoints of the cuts, the two and my, and there are two and those are the vertices of the cuts. So there are two and minus four vertices and the planar graph tells you that there are so many uh, edges. Uh, so this is, uh, so you get this graph, which is, uh, so what this construction gives you is the graph, which is dual to the original uh, um, uh, Feynman graph that you had over here. Uh, and now comes the thing that was a surprise when, uh, to us because it just came out of the box in some sense that this differential that you had over here to let's say to leading order, uh, uh, the square of the spectral curve is actually what is called a Strebel differential. Uh, and so a Strebel differential is a, 
a very nice mathematical object. It's a quadratic differential. And let's say we are on, it exists on any genus G n punctured Riemann surface. There's a unique, the nice thing is that there's a unique quadratic differential, a meromorphic differential, which has double poles uh, at the end punctures, at exactly the end punctures, the uh, ZIs. Uh, uh, and it has um, the, the defining property is that it has real residues at these double poles. But, and more strongly, actually, the, integ uh, uh, the integral of the square root of this uh, differential uh, between any two zeros uh, uh, is real. Uh, uh, so in general, of course, if you take a quadratic differential, take its square root and compute uh, compute uh, the integral between any two zeros, it will be a complex number. Uh, but the defining property of the Strebel differential is that it has real periods. And that is now exactly what uh, the um, uh, this y naught square had. It uh, These were the zeros, uh, uh, which were the endpoints of the cuts. It has double poles at z equal to zi. And these periods are real because, in fact, they are real. And their interpretation is as the number of these weak contractions. So these are uh, real periods that uh, uh, you have. And so the significance of this treble graph for what, uh, the, or the Strebel differential for uh, this idea of going from uh, Feynman diagrams to uh, the closed strings is as follows. The, the, the Strebel graph has these zeros. Uh, so the Strebel differential has these zeros. And uh, uh, what, uh, and if you, uh, uh, what you uh, actually happens is that the Strebel differential uh, foliates this Riemann surface into various sort of uh, uh, these horizontal trajectories, which are closed trajectories, uh, where this treble differential is sort of real. Uh, and so uh, in general, for a quadratic differential, these horizontal trajectories, which you can define, will not close. But here, for a treble differential, they close. They form these sort of disk-like domains, which are separated by uh, cuts that are joining the zeros of this. So in some sense, the graph that I, the graph that I mentioned here, which has vertices uh, dual, which are vertices that are the zeros of the differential and this cut, this whole cup system of this Riemann surface that uh, corresponds to the, um, uh, to this so-called critical graph of this treble differential. And, and inside each of these uh, domains is, is a disk-like domain. Each contains one of the punctures of the Riemann surface. So the ZIs are these punctures. I put one at infinity, and these AIs are the zeros. And so you get these different domains. And, uh, uh, and this is the critical graph, as I said, that connects the zeros. And that's the graph which I just mentioned was the dual to the original Feynman diagram, or the skeleton of the original Feynman diagram. And uh, so now to sort of uh, go back to that picture of why this is implementing close, open closed string duality, Firstly, these treble differentials, they were, they were of interest to mathematicians because they give a one-to-one -one parameterization of the modelized space, more generally of the genus G modelized space. But, uh, 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 but let's say in our case, the n-puncture um, uh, sphere modelized space, provided you specify the residues of the uh, at the double poles. So the treble differential has double poles with real residues, and in our case, these residues are these alpha i, so those are fixed. And the way it parameterizes them is through these real lengths of these periods, these treble periods that I mentioned over here, which uh, we identified with these periods, these 2n minus 6 periods. So, um, uh, so the, uh, these 2n minus 6 lengths give a real parameterization of this 2n minus 6 dimensional space. In fact, it gives a kind of a simplicial decomposition, like I was saying earlier, where these, uh, as these lengths vary, uh, they cover one cell. But then uh, you can have different uh, topologies for, the, for this critical graph, and you get different cells. And you, this is how you kind of patch up the whole modelized space. So 
So to each Strabble graph, you can associate a unique point on the modelized space. Uh, and the way that happens is like what I was saying, there's a, uh, and I'll uh, have a picture in the next slide, uh, that for each Feynman graph, uh, which will be specified by these numbers, because these are the numbers of the Wick contractions, like I said. So these are the periods of the Strabble differential, where, which parameterize then the, um, the points on the modelized space. And uh, uh, you get to each such graph, um, uh, you get a dual Strabble graph. And therefore, and in fact, that Strabble graph tells you how these uh, ribbon graphs are kind of glued up and it realizes this uh, prescription. And in some sense, the exact dictionary between uh, the Strebel lengths and these big contractions was something that uh, Razamath had actually pointed out as a possible way in which this uh, connection could take place for Gaussian matrix models. But here we see, at least in this large end limit, something like this happening uh, in this uh, more general case. And in this large end limit, these take continuous values. So that is sort of to go towards what um, uh, Costas was asking, that in this large end limit, you fill out the whole moduli space uh, because these lengths can take uh, arbitrary continuous values. So this is sort of a yes. picture for how to visualize the Strebel differential, uh, how it glues up to give you the surface. So if you have these big contractions, uh, and I've <clears throat> just drawn them with different colors here, you can, uh, you can glue them together. Uh, and so these, if you wish, these get glued up into these quadrilaterals over here. And uh, the original Feynman diagrams, these double line diagrams, uh, these uh, these are orthogonal to this horizontal trajectories over here. In fact, these are what are called vertical trajectories of the Strebel differential. And each of these, so they patch up uh, to form uh, a surface. And as you vary the number of these lengths, you vary the, the Strebel lengths, you, uh, you sort of vary over the space of Riemann surfaces. Uh, so this uh, gluing up, so each of these quadrilaterals you should think of as uh, essentially conformally equivalent to these half strips uh, and these full strips, but vertical open strips. And these what open strips are getting glued up in this way. And these are these horizontal trajectories that I was drawing in a conformally equivalent way over here. So you should imagine closed strings coming in over here at these vertices. So these are really like closed string uh, uh, so uh, closed string sort of time slices, uh, which are then intersecting and uh, interacting. Okay, I think I've probably um, uh, uh, reached the limit of my time. Uh, I'll just take a couple of minutes um, uh, more, if that's okay, uh, uh, Ando. <laughs> uh, well, I would say we're already over time, so if you can start wrapping up. Uh, say yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm essentially just uh, uh, this thing. Uh, so, um, so this. Uh, um, uh, so, so this is actually to answer what Costas was uh, saying. So the sum over the different Feynman diagrams actually goes over to an integral because the sum over the different big contractions now goes into a sort of a integral over the periods with a flat measure which goes into some top form in more conventional measures. And the integrand is this lunin mathur integrand which has this uh, Liouville action. And the Liouville action, uh, you recall the Liouville field uh, was given in terms of uh, the, uh, the field Y naught, the spectral curve. Uh, and uh, now with our identification of that as the Strebel differential and which in to leading order in large N was also the Schwarzian, you see that this action is nothing but the modulus of the Schwarzschild. So in some ways, what you get is a very nice universal piece that this lunin mathur piece gives you that it, it's somewhat like a generalization of the uh, thing that you, the universal piece that you see in ADS2 with softly broken conformal symmetry. You had the Schwarzschild there from the boundary uh, again. Uh, this is sort of the analog of that. And But given I'm out of time, I'll just, uh, there are 
couple of other ways in which you can also think of this action, which are also very suggestive. Uh, this can be viewed as sort of a Nambu go-to-like action in terms of a Strebel metric. It's also very similar to something uh, like uh, this rigid string actions that people um, had earlier. But all these different forms actually match with the on-shell sigma model action, which we had computed when we started from the string theory side. And this field, this Lubel field became the radial direction of the ADS. So that's sort of how this lunin mathur action connects to the uh, ADS3 on-shell sigma model action, and this phi becomes the radial direction of ADS3. But since I'm out of time, let me just uh, uh, put this transparency up there for as the outlook uh, of uh, the general case of this very special test case where we could carry out this program. And in this case, we had the string world sheet theory as well. So we could see the circle close. Uh, but in some ways, that tells you that you can hope to use now the fact the fact that there is a very concrete case where you can go from the large end QFT to the string theory, which is corroborated by how you go from the string theory to the field theory, uh, gives you hope that you can do it uh, more generally. And there are several other things. And there's a long list of problems in our paper as well. But uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much for the very nice talk. We have a a bunch of questions, but I'm sure that uh, we still have some questions out there. So, uh, Costas, I'm not sure I answered your question. Um, yes, about... no, no, I think uh, you did. I mean, <clears throat> including for the measure. Yes. So uh, I think that's very clear. But uh, can I ask a very naive uh, question? When you do string per super string perturbation theory, you have picture changing and insertions and all sorts of crap. Here, mm -hmm. because it's a topological string, somehow you can uh, get around this. You don't see any of these subtleties. <laughs> So uh, actually, when we um, uh, when we did this uh, from the world sheet point of view, when we were doing this and going from the world sheet to the um, uh, CFT, uh, it was important that we took into account the the sort of analog of the picture changing operators in that world sheet uh, theory uh, to to uh, to sort of get the localization to work. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. So that that is definitely an important part of the in, uh, the the thing. But uh, as you said, in some ways, I mean, it was necessary that they be taken into account. But uh, but in but at the end, they didn't play so much of a role. So it that it is possible that there is some underlying topological string description where you can sort of almost uh, like forget about them uh, and uh, and effectively what the field theory gives you is some integrand which is a sort of a more conventional integrand on the modelized mm -hmm. space well it, conventional to the extent topological string theory integrands on modelized spaces are conventional it may yeah. still teach you something about a supermoduli space and ambiguities of supermoduli space, presumably. Yeah, so we uh, had this sort of, uh, in this particular case of ADS3 times S3 times T4, it was sort of a hybrid formalism that we employed on the world sheet. So there was a part on ADS3 oh. times S3 was Green Schwartz like. So, uh, so you didn't really, so the picture changing entered in a very mild way coming from the T4 part of it and so on. So it, it wasn't a very, uh, yeah, there was an analog of the picture changing, but it was more mild and therefore I think these ambiguities that you mentioned summing over spin structures and so on was not really there uh, and uh, I suspect that there is a way to do this even for ADS5 times S5 perhaps in the Berkowitz formulation and so on where you don't need these uh, where you can sidestep them. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Rajesh, could you say a word about this uh, twistorial in the incidence relation that you mentioned, which seems to give some understanding of this delta function lo localization? Yes. Uh, so, 
Uh, yeah, so that's in a sense a, a whole talk in itself. But uh, just to be brief, uh, the, this ADS three times S three factor of the uh, string theory, which uh, is described in this hybrid formulation uh, at level one, it is described by a, a supergroup sigma model PSU one comma one slash two uh, at level one. Uh, and now this uh, level one supergroup uh, resuminome written model uh, has a free field realization, something like the SU2 level one resuminome written model. Uh, and that free field realization now has bosons and fermions. Uh, and what I mean over here, uh, the, the size are, are the bosonic coordinates in that, uh, in that uh, uh, free field realization. And uh, if you wish, uh, so the, uh, this uh, size can be viewed as some kind of twister like coordinates for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, for the S2 that's on the boundary of the uh, ADS3. Uh, and um, uh, uh, and this, uh, uh, because that's in a way what it is, the, the free field realization is a bit, I mean, it's a, the supergroup PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2. It's a, it's a bit like some kind of a linear sigma model realization of that. And uh, the, uh, uh, the PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 acts on this CP 1 slash 2. So it's essentially the CP 1 which is a kind of a, in a twistorial uh, way of representing the boundary of the ADS3. You can identify and, X as, as the ratio of psi plus of psi minus. Yes, exactly. The ratio of psi plus by psi minus is, becomes the, uh, is, this, uh, uh, is this X uh, in the usual coordinates. And uh, this relation, this linear kind of relation, which tells you that essentially this is, what this relation is essentially tells you that is that X is equal to a covering map uh, uh, and that this vanishes. Uh, I mean, you get a equation which is essentially uh, whose solution is X. It's like uh, the solution yeah. of uh, X times uh, uh, F of X is equal to zero. The only solution is F of X is a delta function. And so, you, uh, so that's how you get the delta function correlators from this and so this is a bit like that twistorial relation which gives you that and it comes it's out very specific uh, for k equals one apparently uh, sorry it's, it's very specific for k equals one there's no remainder yeah it's very one. specific to k equal to one uh, but that is i think where the topological string and this uh, description really uh, holds because for k greater than one uh, it is almost certainly true that uh, there is a continuum in the spectrum and the CFT has some non-compact, I mean, it's, it's a singular CFT in some sense. It cannot be anything like uh, at least that of a T4 symmetric product. There are maybe ideas that uh, there could be a Lubel piece and so on in this symmetric product, but it is likely to be more complicated. But uh, the K equal to one theory is the one where the spectrum is discrete and it has, uh, it's sort of well, uh, so, so there's something very special about the K equal to one. And I think the, the right way to actually think of this is actually through a limit through Ramon Ramon flux, because you can, uh, K equals K jumps by discrete units, but uh, the Ramon Ramon flux you can turn on in a continuous way, at least at weak coupling, uh, because they are quantized in units of G string. So, uh, so you can go from effectively a radius one to one plus epsilon by turning on some epsilon RR flux. Uh, so, so you, there is a continuous way to, I think, go away from this uh, uh, K equal to one theory, which would be, but that uh, will then, uh, where you can still probably use this uh, free field realization in a perturbative sense. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, guys, uh, maybe we can take one more question and then, well, at least we switch off the YouTube video thing and then, well, I mean, we can keep it uh, informal, so. Stan, uh, you take the last question. Uh, the we way cannot this, hear you. Uh, this approach was uh, was formulated, if I understand correctly, is in the 
large and limit because of course it's scaled uh, and the scaled away and there's this and there are the alpha parameters that uh, describe the large and limit so yes how is it possible to imagine uh computing uh one over n corrections in in this form uh, around this uh, yeah, so uh, we haven't systematically studied this, but I think it is possible. I think these uh, loop equations uh, give you the uh, a good starting point because this equation is true for any n. Uh, uh, because it uh -huh. follows uh, pure, uh, these equations are also true for any n. Uh, uh, okay. And uh, so you can, from these equations, uh, directly derive this equation for any n. Uh, and uh, so now you would imagine perturbing then around uh, the uh, leading large n solution in some systematic way, uh, taking this uh, into account. And uh, uh, so this is why I mentioned, uh, if you just do at least in a naive way, if you take this, uh, this correction into account, you'd you actually get even the Schwarzschild. So you get this equation. So in principle, this equation is actually again true at finite n, and you can try to perturb it and solve it. It's a differential equation for, uh, for the covering map, uh, which is now a, a more complicated equation. You know, uh, the leading large n, the solution was algebraic, but now it's a differential equation, yes. Uh, but in principle, this is a nice differential equation. The Schwarzschild equation is uh, is a nice equation, and you can, as uh, Elias was saying, uh, it's uh, related to the uniformization and so on. So you can uh, hope to study this, I think, even further. But uh, we haven't probed that much, uh, and I think this would be very interesting because also because uh, the Schwarzian is a very natural quadratic differential and the Strebel differential is another very natural differential that uh, uh, this, uh, and the two agree at large n and we are not very sure whether it is true for finite n or in one over n or in what way. And so this relation between the Strebel differential and the Schwarzian of the covering map is again a very well posed mathematical question uh, of, uh, 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 these are two very natural quadratic differentials. Are they the same or are they different? Uh, uh. Okay, thank you very much. Let, let's see, yeah, I'm going so to stop the 